I was kind of feeling so bad about my own speed. Am I always going to be left behind? Am I always going to be so slow? So I think those feelings, what I got, were the defining moments for me. Learning and career may not be connected together. These might be two different things. You might be learning things which are not applicable to career, and your career might demand a different set of skills. If you want to progress faster in your life, focus on the skills required to produce the outcome. We all want to learn. Can we make our learning faster, quicker, smarter? Yes, all of those and much more. That's what you are going to hear in today's podcast from the person who calls himself as performance scientist. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Roman, a prolific writer, author of 20 books on Inspire Someone Today. Dr. Raman, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Hey, Shrikant, thank you so much. Really, I appreciate you choosing me as one of your guests. And uh, about me, it's a pretty small introduction. I'm, I'm Dr. Raman. You can call me Raman. I call myself as Performance Accelerator, and that's the area where I work in. I accelerate people's performance. I accelerate their learning. But otherwise, I'm a corporate learning leader at a $30 billion U.S. corporation and I manage training operations worldwide. But uh, learning is something which I love uh, doing, and uh, that's my main area of work. Thank you, Dr. Raman. So I once read this saying from Les Brown, which said, life has no limitations except the one you make. And you are a testimony to that. Your own personal story is all about winning through obstacles. Let's hear it out from you. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And in fact, you reminded me, in fact, I am right now getting coached by Les Brown. I am attending a six-month course with him. And uh, just a few weeks back, uh, I gave a presentation of my story to Les Brown. So you reminded me of him. So he is definitely a great guy. But certainly, you know, um, he has been saying that no limitation can stop you ever. And whatever limitation we make, we make in our own mind. So for your audience, uh, you know, I want to tell that... uh, I am a physically disabled person. I got uh, polio when I was uh, about six months old. And uh, in fact, I don't even remember when I got it because I lost my ability to walk, uh, I would say, well before the age of walking. You know, you, you learn to walk probably two year old, one year old or something. But I lost it long back. But uh, that wasn't uh, something that could have stopped me. Of course, I felt bad in the beginning. When I was a small kid, I used to compare myself with my classmates, with the people around me. And uh, I tried my best to find the answers, why me? And perhaps uh, at later age, I found the answer, why me? Because I was meant to do certain things. So uh, that has been, you know, kind of thing what happened with me in the childhood. But then I kind of, uh, you know, um, turned that around uh, for my favor in regards to how I can progress myself further. So I think a disability is just one thing. Uh, As you said that the limitation we make, those are the only limitations. Otherwise, life has no limitations. And uh, if you see most of the people, they make limitations in their mind, where they're limited in thinking, they're limited in their own opportunity. They think they can't do it. But once they start thinking that they can do it, there is perfectly no limitation in life. So that's my take on that. And that's a superb recovery from the personal situation that you had to where you are today. You are a double doctorate holder and you have kind of uh, redefined the whole uh, life journey that you have been. So tell us two or three critical incidents that helped you to shape the person that you are today. Thank you so much, uh, Shrikan. I think uh, the earliest one which I remember is probably when I was in my primary school, uh, probably seven year old. So when I was seven year old, uh, the only way for me to go to school was uh, wearing uh, uh, what called calipers. I'm not sure you guys know calipers. And those were the things before these all technology based things came in. It's a sort of skeleton made up of iron plates, then leather straps. And then you it, it starts from belly and it goes all the way down to ankle. 
this is like a kind of support system that will hold your body in place. But uh, this thing uh, weighed, I think, about 20 kg or something. And back then, when I was seven years old, probably I weighed 20, 22 kg. So you can say it, I was dragging these things on my leg, almost of my, my own weight. So I kind of, uh, you know, remember an incident when uh, I was coming back from my primary school. So I was coming back with my friends, with my classmates. And uh, I can tell you with that weight I was carrying, it was very, very difficult for me to really walk. So I was obviously very slow. And uh, seven-year-old kids, they are, you know, they are fun and they like to run around. Uh, I kind of, you know, was left behind. And uh, that incident kind of repeated many times in my life. So there was one thing that kind of struck me at that time because I was kind of feeling so bad about my own speed. Am I always going to be left behind? Am I always going to be so slow? So I think those feelings, what I got were the defining moments for me. And that's where, you know, I started thinking that, okay, I can't walk. I can't walk fast like other people, but is there something else I can walk fast? And the answer came many years later when I figured out that, okay, I can use my mind. I can use my brain. I can possibly learn faster than other people. And I indeed had some luxuries. I mean, I couldn't walk, so I was stay put at one place. So I could read books. I could learn anything I wanted. So there was no boundary. So that's where I found my speed. And eventually that has grown me into a performance scientist where I specialize now in speed. So irony is I can't walk, but I teach organizations and professionals how to walk fast in their life, in their jobs. So that's how I would say that that defining moment basically translated me. Uh, you can say it kind of obsessed me for speed. I should say you don't only make companies to walk fast, you make them run faster. Oh, yeah. I mean, I try my best. I think uh, speed is very important because if you see the world around you and me is running so fast, business is moving at such a rate, technologies are coming at uh, a very high speed. And uh, there are so much things to learn and so many things to perform. And there is not enough time. So the only way people are going to be successful and stay ahead is by running fast. And running fast, I don't mean they need to compete with their friends. But what it means is that the life is throwing things at you at a, such a speed that you're going to need to walk fast. So, yeah, that's the thing I try to help people with. Well. You set the stage for the next uh, segue into what we want to talk. Because like you mentioned, we are in a world that is running fast. We are in a VUCA world. So where the transformation that is happening to the organizations, to individuals is very, very rapid. How can one develop this whole concept of speed learning? How do we ensure that you learn faster so that you are keeping pace with the changes that's happening around you? What are some of those things? based on your own professional experience that you can share with our uh, listeners? Yeah, well, great question, Shrika. I'm glad that you asked. Uh, and in fact, it's a very, very contemporary question. I mean, that's the things are happening around us. Things are uncertain. And particularly this uh, in pandemic, things are so uncertain. And the moment we're going to come out of this pandemic, things are going to be complex. And things are also going to be still uncertain. And uh, there is a, so much a lag in the business and people's progression and during this time that they need to move fast. So there are a few things that, you know, people would need to really be careful about. But let's first set the ground of one thing. Learning is the foundational process in our life. We are born to learn. And without learning, we don't progress. But then when it comes to professional business, learning has to be purpose-driven. Learning has to have a purpose. So one learning is when you enjoy learning, you learn things, you learn content, you seek knowledge, you seek wisdom. But then there is another kind of learning which you learn for mastery in skills, mastery in the things you need to perform. So these are two different approaches that people need to adopt depending upon what their goal is. So let's kind of break it down. If the, your goal is the professional success, if you are a professional working in an organization, or if you are a businessman who is trying to progress further, you know, expanding the business, or you could be an executive handling a large team. 
So the idea about learning is not for the sake of learning, not for the sake of accumulating knowledge. It's for the sake of gaining the proficiency or mastery in the skills, what you're going to need moving forward. So when we talk about those things, um, what I have learned from my research and from my personal experiences, as professionals, we always think we are all alone. It's my race. It's only me who's going to be, you know, learn and I'm going to be going ahead of others or this is my race. But the moment we change that thought process to something else, when we say, you know what, I'm not alone because people don't learn alone in a professional setting, in a business setting. We work with people. We work with executive. We work with clients. We work with customer. We work with team members. So we are not alone. And then we work with technologies. We work with the systems. We work with resources or tools. So when we think about the entire ecosystem, that moment we'll realize we are not alone. If I don't know something today to perform my job, is there somebody in my team who can help me? That's number one. If I don't know anything today, is there a network of uh, coaches or mentors I can approach? Those who can quickly tell me or guide me how to move forward. If I don't know anything or I don't know a particular skill, is there a technology that can help me? Is there any tool or resources that can help me? And, uh, you know, when we look at the entire system, then we also look at, professional can look at is, if I don't know this thing, can my manager set up an assignment for me so that I can learn this one, so I get an opportunity? If I don't get opportunity, I won't learn it. So my concept of learning is, learning does not happen in isolation. If you need to learn fast, you got to need to set up an ecosystem around you. And in fact, the ecosystem is already there. All you have to do is leverage it. You don't have to learn everything today. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say that you are a financial analyst and your job is to set up certain set of reports for uh, higher management. Imagine that there would be certain reports you're going to need to create once in every two years. Now, you don't need to learn those skills today. You don't need mastery in those skills today because you're going to need those skills two years later. So if you're going to spend your time learning today, it's going to slow you down. But when you learn it, when you need it, it accelerates your path to move forward in your profession at a faster rate. So those are the kind of things we need to consider is, is it immediately needed? Is it urgent right now? Or can it wait? Or do I need to master it later? Or do I need to master? Or can I leverage my network, my technologies, my support system around me? So that's the kind of thought process I wanted to set uh, certain grounds. That that's the way professionals can accelerate their learning. It's not just about what goes in your mind. It's all about what do you use to perform a given project or a task. I hope I was very clear about. Uh, what the philosophy is behind this. Yeah, I particularly like the point about proficiency versus knowledge. Proficiency is for the job that you kind of do. Knowledge is more long-term kind of stuff. And for your competency development, what you're saying is lean into the network that you have around you. That's correct. That's correct. And I want to add one thing here that you pointed out well. What's your goal? Is it gaining the knowledge or is it the performance? You need to kind of separate it out. Again, when it comes to performance, we need to make sure we want to become good. When we you know, come out of our home in the morning, we go to our workplace, we want to do a great job. We want to achieve the mastery in whatever we do. We want to be good. We want to be proficient in that. So performance alone does not define what the output is expected out of you. So knowledge, it can be a long-term process for your life. It can be for your personal satisfaction. But now the world is moving more into wisdom-based because wisdom is where you draw the inferences, where you draw the insights. And that was the other part of your question. The VUCA world is becoming complex. When there is a lot of complexity, knowledge is not going to help. You can learn, you can read books, you can acquire knowledge, but that may not work in today's world. Today's world needs distilled wisdom, distilled insights. And that's why they call it wisdom-based economy today. So when we look at the complexity, we're going to need to go underneath. We need to deeply understand and we need to kind of tap upon the wisdom of different people from their experimentation. 
And that's another way professionals and executives can accelerate their path in this complex world. Right. And what are some of those methods that you would recommend that one can start looking into developing those kind of skills or wisdom-based insights that you have seen? Right. Again, we will go back to that foundation. What's the goal? If the goal is personal learning, that you want to learn content, you want to learn information versus your goal is to acquire the proficiency in, in your job role or the project you're doing or an assignment you're doing. So when once you separate out the goal, so you got to need to think about a few things that uh, are you going to start as an individual or are you going to start as a part of the member of an ecosystem? So that was the number one thing you're going to need to look at. There are lots of things that you can leverage. And most of the time, you know, people, when they start learning and professional, they make it their personal race. And the moment they make it personal race, what happens is their time to learn is much longer. So my recommendation, number one, is first you have a blueprint of your ecosystem. And when you have a blueprint of an ecosystem, what it means is, number one thing you're going to need to look at is, do I have the people who can coach me in my network? Do I have the right kind of mentors? Do I even I have a trainer? So many times we underrate this thing. Coach is very important in today's world. Coach are the people who have experienced that thing before. So if you can tap somebody's uh, experience, you possibly don't have to reinvent it again. So create a network of coaches. For professional and executives particularly, I always tell them, build a solid network of coaches. Uh, while we these days we do a lot of networking, but uh, when we do networking, we don't always... Uh, do with the intention of building network of coaches. So what I tell them is you can build your peer network. That's one thing, but you also need to build the network of coaches. And uh, when I say coaches, it can include mentors. It can include trainers. So there is a difference. Some people may have the experience in exact thing what you're already doing, but some people may have experience in an allied area, which you can tap upon. So that's number one thing I tell them. That's one. Second thing I tell them is look at whether you need to master everything right now. If you don't need to master everything right now, you possibly don't need to even spend your time learning it. For instance, uh, let's say that uh, your job is to manage sales. So when your job is to manage sales, you need to be really sure how do you guide your team to be able to get that kind of sales because that's your primary goal. Now, you could be weak in several other skills in managing the team, or you could be weak in doing other part of the job, but that's okay. You don't need to master those now. You need to master your outcomes. So that's number two thing, which I tell people that uh, they got uh, that thing that's coming in. And then there is another thing that came in, which not many people really apply. So it came from my research and there is already pretty established research in that area. What we call as, a, I would call it lean, lean path. Lean learning path, or you can call it lean proficiency path. Let me break it down for you what exactly it means. You're going to need to reach at a certain point. You need to be very clear what exactly do you want to master. So once you understand what you want to master, then you work backward to figure out these are the things I'm going to need to master to break it down. So that's one part which I talked earlier. But then what you do is you sequence it. You sequence it in a way that you eliminate any wasteful activity out of that path. The moment you remove the undesired activities, which is not leading to that goal, you save a lot of time. So theoretically speaking and practically speaking, the moment you only put in that particular path, okay, this is the order I'm going to do, and these are the most essential thing to reach to my goal, you only focus on that. So the time to proficiency actually gets shortened. So these are the three, I think, uh, major strategies that can work for professionals more often. Great. And I will put you in a spot here, which is drawing on your own experience that in a very short span of time, you have authored close to 20 plus books, right? So how did you go about doing it? How was this pace set and how did you go about doing it? And what was some of your learning moments in this whole uh, process? Okay, that's a big question, by the way. <laughs> I had uh, many decades at my disposal to do the experiments to reach to that point. So it didn't happen overnight. Nothing really happened overnight, right? It takes time. Um, but that's uh, where the whole concept of time comes in. 
So for instance, uh, you know, I wrote 20 books and I also kind of got into a lot of uh, uh, qualifications. I went on for doing some programs, some courses, some degrees and all that. So part of this one is there is a technique called interleaving. So the interleaving is something, it might be counterintuitive technique. Most of the time people tell you that, okay, you got something, you start something, focus on this and don't leave it until you finish it, right? But that mm-hmm. does not happen in our day-to-day life. We get distracted. There are a lot of things that uh, you know keep going around. There are family things that will be all the time surrounding you. There are a lot of uh, challenges at the workplace. So what happens is you are likely to drop the things. But then also at the same time, as a human, we don't keep focused on one thing because our, our mind is so fertile. We keep changing our interests. We keep changing our hobbies. So one of the things what I learned is that it is okay to start many things at the same time. But what you need to do is you need to have a sort of bookmarking system that, okay, you do something, you do it for certain minutes or certain hours, depending upon how much time you have, you can leave it there, no problem. You can start something you know, in parallel. You do a little bit on that one, it's all right. You can you know, pause it, then you can start the third thing, no problem. But the discipline, what you're going to need to do is you need to make sure that you know how many streams you have started. So when I start writing books, I don't write one book. I write three or four, five books at the same time. The way it works is interleaving technique works like this. I put together a certain amount of content, probably half a page or two paragraph or something for one book. I stop it. Then I get on with my work. I get on with my own assignment. And during that time, there are a lot of fertile ideas that will flow in my mind. And possibly those lines up with the, you will start thinking about maybe, you know what, I'm thinking about this is how things can become more effective. But I'm not writing the book on effectiveness. I'm writing on something else. But then this idea needs to be captured somewhere. So I'll go and capture it, write two paragraphs, and I'll pause it there. I'll wait for the next ideas. So what happens is that wherever the idea comes in, I keep parking in those streams. So three months later, six months later, you will see that you have substantial material for each of these streams. And now what you need to do, you need to have find time to finish each of these one by one. So when we start doing things, one thing at one time, sometimes we want it to be so perfect that that perfection never comes. So that's why I kind of start with a lot of different things. And then I kind of uh, keep finishing it one by one as I kind of come close to the climax. So that's one technique called interleaving. So interleaving technique is a little bit different from uh, the technique uh, typically advocated. We say continuous focus. So I say, you know, it's very difficult in today's world. It's so challenging to be continuously focused on one thing. It's okay to focus on many things. But then you need to come back to each of those whenever time permits. Right. And that's a very interesting concept. So interleaving technique, that's a good one. I think connected to both of these elements, one you did touch upon how one can accelerate learning and your own experience of how you have been being a prolific writer. And for a lot of the working professionals out there, the obvious question is, how can we leverage all of this learning to accelerate our own professional careers? What do you recommend for folks like that? Okay, I need to clarify this question. Are you referring to the people who are a mid, mid-career or senior people? Because techniques will work differently for different set of career. So which career we are talking about? Maybe we can give one example or uh, one specific technique for both at mid-career as well as senior uh, folks. All right. So here's the thing, you know, I, I kind of need to differentiate this thing. Learning and career may not be connected together. These might be two different things you might be learning things which are not applicable to career and your career might demand a different set of skills. And this is where, you know, kind of uh, the whole dilemma comes in that where do I spend my time? Do I spend time in performing the things I have been given or do I spend my time learning that new thing so I can progress my career? So that's where, you know, the one one of the very important piece that comes in is that we need to design our career. How many people are out there, those who design their career? So when I say design your career, that means you need to decide that where you want to go. What's your next role? So one of the things which I learned in my professional career is people don't progress until they perform 
the task of next level. So if you're a senior manager, nobody's going to make you a director unless you start delivering like a director in your current job. That's one very key piece. Most of the time, we miss it out. Most of the time, we are so busy delivering um, what is required in my current job, as opposed to thinking about what's required in the next level, and I need to produce that today. If I don't produce those things today, if I don't show those uh, approaches, those strategies now to management, nobody is going to ever know I have the capability to be there. So I think the progression in the career comes when you show that you are built for the next role. That's number one. So what it means then is that you need to be able to define, okay, I'm going to need to go into a director's level. What is a director's typical way of working? What skills I'm going to need? What kind of projects I'm going to need? Do I even have those projects today or not? So number one thing is that you kind of need to go and talk to your manager. That you know what? In the next three years, I want to be a director. Tell me what are the kind of things you're looking for a director? Do I have those? How much is the gap is? So I need to understand my delta, that how far I am from those objectives. Most of the time, your higher manager would always support you because they also have intention to progress further. So once they have the right people to take their job, they can progress faster. So that's number one. So once we understand what behavior, what skills are required for that particular position, then question come is, how do you design your path? So that's what I was talking about is the lean proficiency path. Now, the, the target you have here is you want to be a proficient director. If becoming director is your next goal. Now, director is going to need certain skills. He has certain outcomes that he needs to produce. Here is the problem that comes with. And most of the promotions and most of the progression get failed just because of one thing. And that's the concept I'm going to share you with the, based on my research. There are one set of skills, what we call as input skills. Input skills are all the skills that are required in your job in order to just to produce day-to-day -day deliverables. And then there are skills which we call as output skills. Output skills are the skills required to actually produce the outcomes. So now, if you want to progress faster in your life, that means you need to understand what a director is supposed to perform and what will be his outcomes. So when you focus on outcome, you only focus on getting the mastery in the outcome skills, the skills required to produce those outcomes. But most of the time, where do we spend our time? Okay, I'm going to be a director. I will spend a lot of time in learning advanced PowerPoint presentation. I will spend a lot of time understanding how do I develop my strategic skills, okay? I will spend a lot of time trying to understand new technology that can make my job because I see my director using those tools. Using tools, technologies, those things are all input skills. That's not going to give an advantage. Advantage comes when you start producing like directors. So that's where, you know, the, the concept comes is if you want to progress faster in your life, focus on the skills required to produce the outcome. For instance, if the director's job required to produce a strategy, question comes in, you're going to need to show that you can deliver strategy and you need to learn only those skills. You don't need to learn any other skills like leadership or team management or anything. Those are secondary or maybe tertiary skills. So you're going to need to focus on the primary outcome skills. So that will always accelerate because you will get noticed very quickly. So that's the kind of something that comes from research, input skills versus output skills. And there is also one thing that input skills keep changing. Input skills keep changing at a, such a faster rate, but output skills do not change much. For instance, a director's job in regards to creating strategy will never change. Its, its concept, its feel, its level of competency will stay same. So once you master this, you master this. But the input skills are like using this platform, using another technology that's coming in, a way you do the data analytics. There are those things that are going to keep changing every six months. But if you chase that learning, it's never going to end. So that's my number one recommendation, how people can accelerate. Just focus on the output. And one of the research studies says when we focus on output, roughly 30% of the skills are required what we need to focus on. But when you start with the input, you're going to need to learn all 100%.
And many time we get tired after 70% and the most essential 30% are left behind. But if we focus on, you know, this a different path, you start with those most essential 30% and you're done. You're a star player already. That's a brilliant insight. Thank you so much. Focus on output skills, less on input skills. Great. Raman, you yourself have been a prolific uh, writer. And uh, if there is somebody were to write a book on yourself, what would the title of that book be? Okay, that's a great question. I haven't thought about that one yet, really. I don't know really uh, what it would be because it depends upon the lens people are going to see. Uh, you see, we, we all have very complex personalities. And the, the, what we come across to one person versus to other person, it may not be same. So it depends upon which lens you want to see, right? So there are different dimensions to people's uh, life. I got to tell you that this a disability thing for about 40 years of my life, nobody knew because people never even knew that I had any disability or anything because I never mentioned it. So it all depends upon what you know about me and what part of thing uh, you think is important. Certain people feel about learning part of me, my life is more important. And then just some people think that my disability part is that are more inspiring. Uh, but I believe what I have done is it can summarize in one sentence, what I call is a disability to desirability. Disability could be your lack. Desirability is something you always want, right? It can be anything you want, but it's ultimately the desirability you look for within, you know, in your circle around people around you in your professional life, in your personal life. So possibly the title of book would be Disability to Desirability. That's a beautiful title. For a lot of the listeners out there, if they have to reach out to you, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Best way, I think, is my LinkedIn. And they can search for Dr. Raman K. Atri at LinkedIn. Uh, I personally like to get connected on LinkedIn. But uh, otherwise, you know, I am on most of the other social media platforms, not very active, but people can find me anywhere. And if somebody is more interested in uh, looking at, uh, you know, my talks or videos, then they can search for my YouTube channel. It's uh, called Raman K. Atri. So a simple search can give you that channel and uh, they can enjoy some of those videos there. That's how. They can connect with me. Great. And we'll make sure that all of this information is made available in the show notes. Raman, you gave us a lot of insights around purpose-driven learning, uh, the lean techniques, interliving, current versus future dilemma of should we focus on input skills or should we focus on output skills? If there is an Inspire Someone Today message for everybody out there, what's Raman's Inspire Someone Today message going to be? My message uh, to people is that, you know, guys, uh, focus on your learning, okay? And learning is something inseparable. When you're going to hit the bad times in your life, learning is what's going to come to save you. And when you're going to hit a jackpot for the best times in your life, learning is something which is going to propel you further for more success. So focus on your personal and professional learning and uh, make sure that the learning has a purpose. It has a, a goal. You should know that if you are going to use learning as an engine, where really you want to go? This could be your superpower. I found my superpower in the form of uh, exploring learning. And I can tell you, this is such a basic uh, human process. And in fact, it is superpower for many people, but we don't always realize it. So go find it, realize it. Nothing can stop you to learn the way you want or as much you want. Super. Go find your superpower. That's the message. Raman, thank you so much for taking time and sharing your experiences, your anecdotes of how one can make learning as an advantage. Appreciate you sharing your thoughts and looking forward to talking to you a lot more. My pleasure to be on your show, Shrika. Thank you so much. It was a great opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening into today's edition of Inspire Someone Today. It's been a privilege to bring in these conversations. If you like this episode and have any feedback or comments, do mail me at inspiresomeonetodaypodcast at the rate gmail.com. Inspiring someone is like creating ripples around us. If you like what you listen, feel free to share them and let's create ripples of inspiration. Do not forget to follow me on my Instagram handle at the rate inspiresomeonetodaypodcast for all the latest updates. 
This is Srikant, your host, signing off. And until next time, keep inspiring.